Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's Artists and Artists Lecture Series. I'm Kelly Kivlin, one of the assistant curators at DIA. And for those that don't know, although I see a lot of familiar uh, faces, this series began in 2001. And since then, we've welcomed over 80 artists to come and share their voices and to reflect and think about and ruminate on various artists in our collection, our temporary exhibition history, and our performance program. So it's really been sort of a gem of a series, beloved, I think, by many, but it also is really special for us at DIA, just being able to look at that list and look at all of those that have participated. Um, thank you tonight, or thank you again to, for joining us tonight in welcoming Francis Stark, um, who is gonna be giving a lecture on Robert Ryman. And just a few notes of thanks um, for our funders and our sponsors. We're very honored to present this series in part with public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And also great thanks to Brooklyn Brewery for the beverages. And last but not least, I'd like to thank all my colleagues at DIA who make this program possible and synchronize all the various invisible elements um, that make it possible tonight. And finally, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the artist Francis Stark, who's joining us this evening from LA, and it's a pleasure to introduce you. Born in 1967 in Huntington Beach, California, Stark graduated from San Francisco State University in 91, and then immediately went on to receive her MFA from the Art Center College of Design Pasadena in 93. Since then, she has been based in Los Angeles, where she's become well known for her practice both as an artist and writer. Often autobiographical and self-referential, her work is centered on language, oscillating between appropriative texts to more personal anecdotes, yet it is always reflective of current, and dare I say even culturally, cultural visuality. At the heart of this, which I mean both figuratively and emotionally, is an exploration into the interrelation between graphic and textual materials in various mediums, including drawing and painting, writing and photography, to video and performance. I highly recommend you take a look at her collected uh, writings, which are on display in our book, our book cart out front, um, which includes text she develops for over a 20-year span, from 93 when she, when she uh, finished her time at graduate school to 2003. And as evidence in this collection, speaking and writing about art is not foreign to Stark. In fact, it is close to her process and practice as both a thinker and maker of art. In a little known published conversation with art writer and philosopher Jan Verwert, Stark stated, Stark stated, quote, there is a kind of irreconcilability between the conditions of maintaining one's own exhibitionism through displaying objects in gallery spaces and the aspiration to be intellectually responsible and communicate in a quasi enlightening or honest or discursive manner, which is writing. For me, this statement evokes the agency in Stark's use of language in both her visual and writing practice as a continual investigation into the politics and urgency of art making, both personally and culturally. Please join me in welcoming Francis Stark. Thank you, thank you so much. Ah, it's a total honor to be here to um, participate in this series. Um, and it is, um, like Kelly said, something I have been doing for um, off and on for a while is to kind of speak, um, uh, speak on others' practices through my, through myself in a way. So, um, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible so I don't run off um, and get lost before we run out of time. But um, so I'd like to just begin by focusing on what we're looking at. And um, you probably all recognize this wonderful work on paper, um, which you may know is made on an announcement card. You can see the word sculpture. Um, there. And he, uh, Robert Ryman actually wrote that text. I was always under the impression that that was like the title of a show or something, but no, he, <laughs> he actually wrote that. Um, and so it is a bit of an anomaly because it is such an assertive text. Um, 
What you see on the right is um, a photograph I've taken on my iPhone in my studio. And um, in my studio practice, I use my phone a lot, like everybody does constantly. And um, I use it for distractions and also for studying. Um, this is, a, in a way, a, like a drawing to me. It's the well-known uh, catalog resume of Robert Ryman. And that's on my black table in which you see the studio windows reflected. And they have shoe polish rubbed on them so that people can't see it. And, <laughs> and um, the photograph on the left is um, the square format comes from Instagram, which is a um, app that is very popular and which I use um, regularly. And uh, we'll get into that later in terms of what that means, what kind of flow of imagery that is. Um, so that's where the square format comes from. But here you see I'm taking a photograph of one of the fasteners at Dia Beacon. Um, on the right is a little excerpt from a book that I published, which was, a, in a way, a follow-up to the book that Kelly mentioned, The Collected Writings, and that was called The Collected Works. And one of the things that is, um, that one of the conditions of my practice, I guess, or one of the characteristics is that I've always um, been navigating this space between um, the sort of vertical state of apprehension and understanding and a kind of horizontal one. And, and when I got to study at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, um, I had not studied art. I did not take art history. I did not learn in an art school. I just went to San Francisco State where I got a major in humanities or a Bachelor of Arts in the Humanities, which was a interdisciplinary kind of liberal arts um, course, which focused heavily on reading. And so as an artist, I come to art as a reader and an as you know, with aspirations to be a writer. Um, and what readers do is they touch texts and texts touch them. And in this image that you see that's taken from my book of works, um, you see a lot of pages that have been touched and marked and annotated. Um, um, the first little bit, what, what basically what happens is that the, um, I had done this book of writing and I had been making art all along and um, I really felt like I was always only recognized for my voice as a writer and that my work wasn't quite, didn't quite get the same kind of traction. And, um, and, um, and so I thought, oh, if I could just have a companion book to my, to my writing that is only the visuals, it would be only visuals and no text at all. And then the person I was making the book with kind of laughed at me like, that's, I don't think that's gonna work. And, and so it was this kind of interesting discovery process in which I, I um, was sort of forced to understand or sort of, I basically ended, I had to, what happened was instead of having no writing, it had to be all writing by me. So what, ha what happened was it became a kind of like a comic book where there was like a grid structure and then each reproduction would go in one of these little cells and then there would be a little, little nugget of language underneath. And so it was in a way like a kind of slideshow and you had my voice and listen to that. So here I'm reading La 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 from T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland, and then I go into Miss Lonely Hearts. Um, um, whether spontaneous thoughts or ready-made insights delivered from a teacher, marginalia shows a reader perching intermittently on the body of a text, leaving reminders to re-enter here, or summaries to say, no need to cover that ground, this ground again. This 
Uh, Nathaniel Westmiss Lonely Hearts is a man hired to give advice in a newspaper column. He takes the inarticulate expressions of genuine suffering seriously. Okay, so then what you see is his marks of escape, uh, you know, um, uh, his editor runs through some possible avenues of escape, handily enumerated here by the reader, escape to the soil, to the South Seas, hedonism, art, <coughs> suicide, drugs, God, parody. So um, before, I just, I have always, I've been a fan of um, Ryman for some time. Once I got to Art Center and I brought my kind of um, conceptual, uh, uh, um, intellectual history influence into a studio with no studio background. Um, I, d I like to tape a lot of things to the walls, and so people would always say Robert Ryman, Robert Ryman, and I was like, I have no idea who Robert Ryman is. I had better go look that up. And, um, and it didn't really totally make sense to me um, in the sense of that felt like um, a kind of a form so kind of like I didn't have the right to enter it or something in a way, um, but but when I but when I finally came to see a Robert Ryman, um, a room full of Robert Ryman um, works installed, I had like a revelation, <laughs> and and that's one of those things. So I'm not going to talk about what that is because that is very difficult to talk about. But I will say that. Um, I, it's something I'll never forget. And when I was at Beacon, by chance, in the last time I was in New York, I was here to speak about Sigmar Polka. And I was also at the New Museum to speak with a um, uh, technologist um, from, the, from the app Snapchat. And I had just done these two things. And I was really kind of, oh, you know, overwhelmed. And I, I was at a dinner and la, 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 and all the food and the waiters and the, like, Busby Berkeley and whatnot. <laughs> um, and then I went in to see the Ryman's, and I really had the funny experience of um, like someone didn't turn the lights on, but not literally the lights, but it was like the work didn't turn on, like it didn't do what I had, you know, that sort of first memory. And I thought that that was really interesting, and I knew absolutely that it had to do with my own brain and my own mind and whatnot. So um, moving right along. Um, what I want to do now, actually, is um, I want to go back to 2000. And um, I wrote a text. I was commissioned to write a text for an exhibition called Painting at the Edge of the World, curated by Douglas Fogel. And I wrote a text and titled it Scared to Death. And it starts with this quote from Emily Dickinson, um, speech is a symptom of affection. But before I read that, and I'm going to read from a different, more um, uh, careful or more calmly designed version of that, um, what I wanted to do, uh, what I was trying to say is that because I come, because I became a fan of Ryman, not from reading about Ryman, or from, not from like sort of like coming at him for why he was important, but more for what the sort of evidence of of the comp like that the moment of actually facing the facts of what's in front of me. Um, I only just since deciding to, or since being invited to do this, I only just started to read more, not that I hadn't read about him, but started to read more. And so I wanted to get, I wanted to just pull out some of these little, bloop, bloop, you know, uh, sentences upon which I perched. I have a lot, but I'm only going to read a few. Um, and, that, and, and, and this is, they will sort of, you know, unravel as we go. Um, and the first has to do, um, well, the oft-heard criticism, but I could do this, is worth taking seriously. Uh, this is not Ryman, by the way. This is writing on him. Um, and it resonates differently for Ryman because it was the suggestion from which his work began. So this notion of um, there being an anxiety about the duplicity 
or deception in things being simple um, that um, that those responses to the avant-garde that you know, that it was like, oh, my kid could do that, or I could do this, is actually really relevant to him, the writer points out. Um, because that is how he began. And as you know, as you probably know, he began um, um, by taking art classes um, through the Museum of Modern Art, where he was a guard. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in a bit. Um, um, and he was shaped, here's another nice little nugget, he was shaped by the institutional ethos of experiential learning. And another, the museum succeeded in giving consequence to this rhetoric. So at that time when, when he was working there, um, the, um, the, pedago the, the, the pedagogical aspirations of the museum were quite high and they actually were quite, um, effect, you know, um, quite serious about or they took pedagogy with an art seriously and really were laying out a kind of program. And so he is the sort of direct result of this. Um, an impatient cursory glance yields little, while presumptuous critical ascriptions all too often mislead. Another thing I discovered that was um, in a book where every, I mean, in an exhibition where everyone put their favorite books. Uh, I was really surprised to hear that Ryman contributed um, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. And Henry Miller books figure in my own practice as well. Um, here's another quote from Yves Lambois. It appears that reproducibility and fetishization have permeated all aspects of life, have become a natural our natural world. Okay. So, in a sense, I just wanted to throw those out there because I'm not really um, theorizing on any of this. I, I want more to share some kind of um, overlaps and rhymes with you. Um, but so, I'm going back to this text, um, and I'll just read I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll read bits. Speech is a symptom of affection. Emily Dickinson. Some people get up in front of a group of people, and the first thing they have to get out of their mouth is how nervous they are. Did I say that? I said it 10 times. Mm -hmm. Once they do so, they begin to calm down. Some may even ease into eloquence. Most audiences probably don't mind this sort of admission of fear by the person who stands before them, since most people, according to a well-repeated but dubious statistic, fear public speaking more than death itself. <laughs> I assume the horrifying part is in the speech act, the saying of something, rather than facing a public. If you had to sit on a chair in front of an audience and say absolutely nothing, maybe that wouldn't be so scary. Everyone knows death is mandatory, and addressing an audience is not. However, doing something with your scared of death self that would necessitate an audience before and or after your death could very well deliver immortality. That's a concept I learned from Emily Dickinson when I was 15. In any case, I want to start by saying, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a little nervous, but it's not a fear of having to say something, and it's not you, I don't think. It's our big topic painting that has me a bit on edge. <laughs> edge, that's funny. that's funny. I don't know, it's funny now. I don't know if that was deliberate. I think the reason I'm here even addressing the topic is because of another monologue I delivered called The Architect and the Housewife. That began with a cute but mildly macabre rhyme prompted by a housewife's hunger. After searching her cupboards and finding nothing to spread between her bread, she's forced to poke a knife into her hungry head. She tries to make a sandwich with nothing but her brain, which she claims is something like smoked ham. My eyes can serve as olives, she concludes, to garnish the sandwich I am. Um. Um, I'm trying to fast forward here. 
Um, anyway, it goes on, and, and, and uh, let's see, uh, talking about the difference between music and blah, 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 blah. Um, Any time I was ever in the audience on the receiving end of a visiting artist's words, I could see that it was a winged business for them as well. <laughs> Even so, formal or not, because you can watch the words come out, come out of the artist's mouth, a mouth in the vicinity of a projected image of something the artist has done, you can get a really strong sense of the degree to which the speaking artist believes in what they are saying. There doesn't seem to be a prominent, okay, so then I kind of, this is from 2000, I get, get all complainy. Um, um, talking about the role of language essentially, um, where does the artist actually speak? Um, knowing I was supposed to speak to you about painting today, that's a direct lifting of Emma, uh, Virginia Woolf. I decided to go see some artists who have recently begun painting in addition to doing what it is they usually do. That is the thing they are recognized for doing. One of those artists is known for his sculptures, one for his collages, and one for his films. So in this text, and I go and I, I go visit um, three different artists. One is Jason Meadows, who is a sculptor. Um, uh, he showed me a painting he had done, which he has since lost, and I had told him I was going to revisit this text I wrote from 2000, and he went and remade a, like a diagram version of the painting, <laughs> which I described. So he had essentially made a painting of a chair, which at the time to me was profoundly interesting. And um, I describe it in the text. Um, but here it's funny, it's paired with this kind of stand-up figure, and that's who I'm kind of trying to evoke in the text that I'm reading. Um, the other artist was Richard Hawkins, and here's a, a t or early table sculpture, and then a later work, where uh, a later collage. Um, but he he actually in my piece I talk about the paintings that he was making, which were pure paintings, not collage at all, and um, it, and um, but I I like the one here with the curls in it because it reminds me of. Um, this uh, lecture that the artist Charles Ray gave one time where he was describing an exhibition he had um, done at Matthew Marks where he had curated and he brought together Anthony Cairo and the Kuros and some other works, some folk art and whatnot. And when he was in this kind of university context, undergrads, you know, um, he was talking about the statue, the sculpture, and he said, uh, um, you know, we don't know the actual person, the craftsman who made this object, but what we can say is that when they did make it, they uh, made a meaning machine and turned it on. And um, <laughs> it's still on, and it doesn't have to be plugged in. <laughs> and it's still working. And um, I don't, to me, that was one of the most profoundly simple, straightforward articulations of what it means to shape matter with your mind. The third artist that I talked about in this text is the filmmaker and painter, Morgan Fisher. Um, on the left is a still from standard gauge, and on the right is an exhibition, an installation view, and you can see the very literal um, kind of manifestation of this notion of painting existing, um, uh, the, of the other spaces around which uh, for, I can't say I'm, Morgan is, I should have got a quote in here from Morgan because he's like one of the most absurdly eloquent to the point of comedy. Um, person on this kind of thing. And so in any case, um, I wanted to share this again. This is someone else's scholarship here. Uh, <laughs> it's not my own. Um, but the Matisse work um, is wonderful to consider and look at and think about next to this um, view, uh, studio view by Ryman, which is a painted photograph. Um, and I feel I got a little bit of an education from Laura Owens uh, around the time when I was writing this, I think. And um, 
and she was quite preoccupied with this um, this type of Matisse painting. Okay, so the other character that figures into my text, the scared to death text, is from a Thomas Bernhard novel, and he's a museum guard. And um, and so, as you know, okay, so this is these are sketches of Ryman's from from the museum. I'm gonna read. Um, Okay, so Richard Hawkins. Richard said one of the things that prompted him to work with actual paint on canvas was all the time he spent on account of teaching, listening to students lamely attempt to defend their painting efforts. Jason told me he was inspired by the Tintorettos he saw in Venice. I instantly picture Tintoretto's white bearded man as it is reproduced on the cover of at least one edition of Thomas Bernhardt's Old Masters. Bernhardt's novel, A Comedy, takes place in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna. It begins as the storyteller prepares to meet his friend Roger in their usual spot, a settee in front of white bearded man. There Roger, a music critic, sits and lectures the storyteller on topics such as the art of the fugue. Then there's Er Siegler, a museum guard, who for more than 30 years has been every bit the regular as the storyteller and Roger. Er Siegler, who was turned down for police duty on account of his weakness, took a job as a museum guard, which made little difference to him since all he wanted was to wear the same uniform day in and day out. After years of guard duty in the museum, Er Siegler had acquired an understanding of art. Quote, for decades, the museum guys have always been saying the same thing, and of course, a great deal of nonsense, as Herr Roger says, Bernhardt's Herr Siegler says. The art historians only swamp the visitors with their twaddle, says Herr Siegler, who has, over the years, appropriated verbatim many, if not all, of Roger's sentences. As mu a museum guard, Herr Siegler could stand around and look at paintings all day. Robert Ryman was a museum guard too, only in real life and in New York, not Vienna, and he could do the same. Unlike Er Siegler, his first ambition was not to be a cop, but a musician. And now, of course, he is known for his paintings, not his style of guarding them or his saxophone playing. Jason mentioned Robert Ryman and said, you can't do that anymore. And Richard mentioned Ryman and Morgan mentioned Ryman, also intimating one can't paint like that anymore, and all without any prompting from me. All were enamored of Ryman's paintings, and I too am enamored of Ryman's paintings. I struggled to speak of this fascination with Ryman, and embarrassingly enough, I found myself asking, is this some kind of mysticism? Surely mysticism is the wrong word, but I said it anyway since fresh in my mind was this passage from the book Wittgenstein's Vienna. A certain type of language mysticism assigns a central importance in human life to art on the ground that art alone can express the meaning of life. Only art can express moral truth and only the artist can teach the things that matter most in life. Art is a mission. Let's just take a second. <laughs> um, a doctrine of an immediate spiritual intuition of truths believed to transcend or ordinary understanding or of a direct intimate union of the soul with God through contemplation or ecstasy. Part to the whole here. Um, I just like to look at this image and think about. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to get. Sort of. <laughs> I'm not trying to force this to go too deep here. I. Um, I'm going to continue. Um, but. <laughs> I just this 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 notion of this all these words that are like ah God so like you know so not okay when I was studying at art center and I find 
that when contemplating, I suppose, what it means to actually on a to actually forge a practice in which you can function like a philosopher um, and yet simply produce residue <laughs> rather than texts is um, is is something very special and um, And so I think that when you when you look at this, you look at this image and you think of the the individual, you know, the the the, the finished object or the decided upon thing, and and see it in relation to and see it in a, in patterns and understand it as a repetition and as a practice. Um, hmm. Well, I guess I could finish that sentence later. Um, but I, you know, I, this is, I didn't, I was just about to get an art studio. Um, I was working always from my apartment and, um, and I got a job and that is, I just talk about in this text. Um, but, but, but the, the painting that you see here and this, the, this is not, um, this is also not the painting of, this is also not how people make paintings today necessarily. And, um, or how, I, I'm very confused about painting and mark making and what happens in the studio. And, and, and I, ha I guess I have been ever since I started. And one of the, one of the artists um, that, I learned about very early on when I got from my non-art background to art center was um, Jorge Pardo. And uh, uh, so there's a little n bit in here about Jorge Pardo is the artist that prompted the architect and the housewife um, text. Um, I saw a Jorge, Pardo, a Jorge painting the other day that looked like a heap of melted indigo IMAX. Remember those? <laughs> It or something like it may be hanging in my home soon as I live with the gallerist Steve Hansen to whom Jorge has made an unusual offer. When asked for a description of his gallery to be printed in an art fair catalog, Steve submitted the following sentence. We're having a great time here in LA because of our importance. <laughs> Jorge liked the sentence so much he offered to trade a painting for it. <laughs> okay, that economy, like that's 2000. Like, where are we today with these kind of, this kind of hubris, like meta meta? I don't know. Um, it, I really, it's fun to go back and reread that. But not all of us have always been having a great time in LA because of our importance. <laughs> I was employed as a house painter to do faux painting in Mel Gibson's home. This is when I first had a strong urge to make paintings. As I learned, I worked with Casein. I learned what Casein was at Mel Gibson's house. It was several years ago, the same year the OJ trial was blanketing, blanketing the airwaves. We listened to the radio while we worked, and I distinctly remember being agitated to the point of not being able to concentrate when a woman scientist's academic prestige and knowledge were being debunked on the basis that it was untranslatable to a jury of science illiterates. At that point, we had to change to a station that would allow more freedom for our minds to wander. A typical trajectory may have been, does Mel Gibson's wife know most of his professional painters actually aren't painters, but professional artists of a different brand entirely? You see, I was painting every day with three other non-painting women artists, Marnie Weber, Sarah Seeger, and Sharon Lockhart. All of us brought together, not because of our relationship to painting, but because of our relationship to money. <laughs> I believe it was Braveheart that was making Mel Gibson a ton of money at the time, which for us meant we could dedicate entire days to making a new door look old. <laughs> Working with a large variety of media on a window pane in the closet of the guardhouse, I got to thinking that someone could have a nervous breakdown in there someday. 
Such a breakdown could prompt the afflicted individual to spend a lot of time staring at some small insignificant portion of paint, eyes glued to a random set of details. For faux painting to sustain its effect, a viewer must not partake in any isolated or protracted viewing. It is meant for glancing, not looking. I like to believe someone could inevitably break out of the glance mode and start to pay attention, at which point all hell could very well break loose. <laughs> is that all hell breaking loose? It is the pen potential of it. That, that are, there's all hell breaking. Okay, so let's see. Da 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 da. Oh. Bernhardt's Herr Regere tells the storyteller that, quote, the world and mankind have arrived at a state of hell such as the world and mankind have never before arrived at throughout history. And he goes on and on, as is his fashion, and after a fashion. You sneaked off into philosophy and authorship, Regere said, but you are neither a philosopher nor an author. That is what is simultaneously so interesting and so unfortunate about you and in you, because you are not really a philosopher and not really an author either. Because for a philosopher, you lack everything that is characteristic of a philosopher. And for an author, similarly everything, even though you are exactly what I call the philosophical writer, your philosophy is no real philosophy, and your writing is no real writing, he repeated. And a writer who does not publish anything is basically not really a writer. Um. So the discrepancy between his self-image and the public perception may be explained by the basic cultural bias rooted in a traditional opposition of mind and body, intellect and feeling, measured articulation, and expressive spontaneity. Also, at what point, he asked, practically did a painter have enough to work with and nothing superfluous? So speaking of superfluous, super, superfluity, superfluousness, um, what do you mean? This is a installation view of, an, of a work of mine titled Observate Legete Con Me, which means observe, read along with me. Um, and it's actually a video uh, set to music that is comprised of text that appears on a wall in a lit room. So there's no sense of it being a video. Um, install. I mean, it's not like a darkened video room. It's just light on the wall with the words. And I like the exit sign there. Um, so, in this sense, these, this work, this is a work of mine. I'm not going to show you the piece. Maybe some of you know it. Maybe, um, but it, it is essentially um, chats that I have had online with men that I did not really know in real life, and there are nine repeated to set to the aria the catalog aria from, da, from Mozart's Don Giovanni, um, in which he's enumerating all of the women that Don Giovanni has uh, seduced and slept with. So over and over, these, this conversation da, 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 happens. Um, and this is, um, so this is the work, this is recent work of mine. And, um, but, but how, why is it here? Why am I having it here? <laughs> Why am I showing you this? Um, because I, I, I guess it's about um, what is actually necessary to make meaning and how much is necessary to include and show. And um, this is a, I wanted to then 
So this is a work I'm known for now, and I have to say I'm a little hypersensitive recently about um, how I might how I might be perceived as an artist and what kind of art I make or how I make art. Um, that it is so connected to um, uh, a kind of sexualized conversation. Um, and that gets often mistaken for being confessional. And um, so I, I want to instead focus um, on the kind of um, aspects of my work or the source of where this sort of language-based work arises from that is, has very little to do with sex and everything to do with um, language and power. Um, um, not that it doesn't have to do with sex, but... Um, do you know what that is? <laughs> uh, this is the little uh, this is an app, an uh, icon app for Snapchat, which is uh, a ghost. Um, and apparently, I, I, I think that I was invited to speak with the, on, with the Snapchat guy because I was famous for sex chat, but um, because I made art out of it. In any case, I did not use this um, app. I don't know anything about it, but I understanding within the world of sex on the internet or people being hypersexualized and sexting and teenagers and all that, that this is an app that is... Um, special or interesting because the image that you send doesn't stay. So it is ephemeral in any case. I only put this in here because this is actually the last time I was in New York. I came to do this sort of double, like one after another talk. I was talking about Sigmar Polka and I was talking with this guy who, did, who works with Snapchat. Very interesting. <laughs> But I had a kind of, that polka show, like, you know, the little drawing polka, als droga. I mean, wow, I was high off of that show. High. <laughs> really, like, wow. I really um, felt that pretty heavily. <laughs> and, um, and I'm going to try to say something about how and why. Um, uh, but it. <laughs> okay, so let's just, you know what, this is so tacky, but if that's why I'm doing it. Oops. Oh, we don't have a thing. Okay, so basically, this is good. Don't turn it on. So it won't turn it on. <laughs> you know, it's just like, people love for people to stand in front of things and to explain them. <laughs> Okay, so the, the, the polka, so the, going through the whole polka show, the fine, one of the last, the last room is, before you get into the final last constellation of things, there's this painting with, with the castle and the two cartoon ghosts. And then after that, there's the cathedral windows, and then there's a book, the sketchbook, which is just every page painted black with ink. And, um, and then before you walk out the door, the final painting looks almost like it's bleach on a colored paper, but in fact it's white paint and it's a brush stroke. And it looks like a kind of splooge, but it also looks like the universe. <laughs> and if you did see the polka show, you remember in the little atrium, in the main room, when you start the show, the curators had kind of did a, like picked works from every period of his production, um, a life spent making works. And one of the works where it's like he sees, oh, now I forget, it was like the, you know, the planets, and it's just like polka. You know, you see yourself, like seeing yourself, it was like a, um, 
where is the art? Where is the artist in the universe? Like literally, um, and then what? W one of the things that kind of came up in this exhibition for me, um, and it was around in the little area where the little polka as drug. There's like a painting where you see he's telepathically having a conversation with William Blake, and I had just. I saw that, and then I went to Gavin Brown's, where Mark Leckie, who I'm also a fan of, had a show, and he has a death mask of William Blake with the like EKG or what you know, like has the like sensors on it, and I had to laugh because I thought, you know, this is really, this is actually as much of a joke as this seems like. It's actually true, like that. This is the one field in which we regularly and ceremoniously commune with the dead in detail, like really very extreme detail. Do we get messages from beyond? Um, and uh, well, one of the things, what was I was getting into there in the video, I was kind of talking about this, this, this is a phrase I've appropriated from a novelist. Um, that here serves as the title of an exhibition and an exhibition catalog, um, but what of Francis Stark, standing by itself, a naked name, bare as a ghost to whom one would like to lend a sheet. And when I discovered this phrase, I fell in love with this idea or this sort of illumination or this sort of understanding of the ghost or the spirit is there and the sheet, but you can't see it. So it's bare, but it's not bare naked. It's like bare and visible. But the thing, the play here is between something being like having nothing on it as a kind of shame versus a kind of unsee, you know, unknowing, you know, unknowableness. So this idea of lending a sheet like out of courtesy <laughs> is in a way I feel like what artists do to show a spirit that they feel. And I know that is like a really like extremely kind of reductive metaphor there, but I hope that it um, doesn't seem too simplistic. So this idea that what we do is like spit matter on things, push matter on a thing, you know, to show, I mean, in the spirit of how Ryman speaks about the paints um, being a kind of vehicle or not not I don't want to say like that but I mean in the spirit of this this kind of methodical making there is a kind of um, sheet lending going on here to say the least um, and then bringing it back again to this sort of um, immediate apprehension of form. Um, I have this used copy here of a, a book on aesthetic theory. Um, and it's something I made art out of um, right when I got out of school. Uh, I want to, oh wait, I'll show you in a second. Um, but the used thing, I wanted to share this because I thought it was really fantastic, this, in the, this quote from Ryman. Um, in the fall of 68, I did my first show at Conrad Fisher's gallery in Dusseldorf. The exhibition consisted of six paintings on paper panels, nine panels to a painting. The panels were created and shipped in Dusseldorf in the process of getting them through customs. In order to avoid the duty that is to be paid on art arriving in the country, Conrad had listed them as paper and not as paintings. Okay, just don't lie. This still happens all the time. <laughs> Um, so there's this whole thing about val it's valuable, but it's not valuable because we don't want to really admit how valuable it really is. But is that value even real? Ah. But the customs official said, but it is expensive paper, handmade, so you will have to pay so much. Yes, it is expensive paper, Conrad said, but it has been used. <laughs> 
the customs official agreed that it had indeed been used. So the paintings arrived designated as used paper. <laughs> Since that time, I've wondered about the possibility of paintings being defined as used paint. <laughs> anyway, so this is the used book. And this is like one, of, this isn't actually not how it's formed on the paper or what it really looks like. This is taken from a reproduction in a book. And, the, and this work is really hard to photograph and reproduce. But um, this is the kind of work I was making when I, discovered or why I got into Ryman or why people would say, oh, you should look at Ryman. And, um, and, um, uh, and also, I was often then my work started to be collected and I found myself in collections next to Agnes Martin. And, you know, it was like this whole, I was coming from like a really, really different really different state of mind in terms of how I made things or what my practice was like, but then was kind of discovering this other side, this other, uh, other sort of tradition, which um, regardless of the fact that that does not show up in what my work looks like, it informs um, uh, pretty profoundly how I think about what I do specifically in relation to the broader culture. And I'm going way back to old, old work. Um, this is a large-scale work on paper, uh, and it's a text that reads, it repeats to create a field, and the text reads, um, shadow lay on half its height, the other half was bathed in palish rosy light, and that's uh, Thomas Mann from the Magic Mountain. <laughs> This is embarrassing a little bit. Whatever. I was young. No, I like this work a lot, actually. And I think it's, you see, like, my sort of reading or interpretation through a pop um, language, which comes from a Donovan song. So the text reads, one, you know, first top, then middle, then bottom. Uh, first there is a mountain. Then there is no mountain, then there is. That's a Donovan song that's kind of doing zen. Um, this reads, the emptiness in my head could melt with sweet peace into the emptiness of this view. Look at four by fives. Remember them? Um, this says, a place to kill oneself. So that's just a detail. You see the painting, the drawings hanging slightly away from the wall. Um, and this is a work uh, reproduced here on the cover of a book catalog. Um, and to detail, um, Unfortunately, nothing is so diff so hard to achieve as a literary representation of a man thinking. So that's what that looks like. Um, and this is also I'm getting later on. Um, this is a collage made with announcement cards. The chrysanthemum, each little page leaf or petal is a you know cut from a different printed matter that came through my door you know my mail slot um, inlaid into rice paper and then there's a kind of like collage element inlaid kind of stamp signature on the bottom 50 percent head you can't read this a low res but it says hallelujah and something about Stuart Bailey <laughs> It was a designer I was working with. Um, and this is, uh, this is my version of a painting. And I'm always embarrassed when I call them paintings. But this is quite large. It's on a panel. And it's a studio door. Um, that's my studio door. That's what it looks like. And then what's going in it are other people's announcement cards.
It's called Push. And then uh, much later, I did a piece called Pull After Push. And there again, you see the studio windows like you saw in the first slide. And above the little girl that looks like me is a sketch of a Sylvia Slay painting. And then there is Push After Pull After Push. And this is another large scale. And then on the right is the Sylvia Slay painting in progress, being informed by, you could see the painting itself directly to the left. And then there's that have like Pharrell and 50 Cent and Ad Reinhardt and some Boetti. So you got to be careful what you let in here. <laughs> I just want to show a few little um, of these kind of Instagram prints as they come from the latest show that I made. Um, it's quite complicated, and I don't want to waste any time trying to contextualize it. But um, in any sense, this is an artist who is only a few years younger than me, who is a famous uh, or legendary West Coast gangster rapper named DJ Quick who I've become quite enamored of, um, the way artists fall in love with other artists. And one of the, I was quite inspired to um, incorporate him and the whole kind of narrative that he's, uh, or aspects of the narrative of gangster rap as it played out in the early 90s in Los Angeles while I was studying at Art Center with Mike Kelly and Steve Prina. <laughs> kind of thinking, re rethinking this, this um, body of work of his. And one of the things I discovered about him as, was that he was very disgruntled with the music industry. And, um, you know, as so many people are disgruntled with their industries. But, but, this, but, but I, I was quite moved by this sort of admission of the idea of like, of wanting, and this is only a fraction of it, wanting to somehow make something in a different place. Like get out of your field and do what you do in a different way, in a different place. And um, because what, I mean, if, if you see he's a hip hop artist, but if hip hop, if his talents are being wasted in hip hop right now, why is that? Like what is it about the kind of moment and the context that doesn't allow for, for evolving. <laughs> and um, this is just a joke here. This is my kicked a hole in my wall because I was angry <laughs> about the perceived role of art studio artist as art educator in a university. But back to this kind of ghost idea, and um, I want to connect that kind of cartoon ghost figure with something I brought up earlier about this sort of anxiety about the avant-garde, like my kid can do that, like anybody can do that. It's not valuable or something like um, that there's something so profoundly fake about these images which depict so-called ectoplasm a kind of material manifestation of spirit and it's never anything I took seriously and um, <laughs> there's a few you know there's some Mike Kelly jokes about this in his work that you probably saw in the PS1 show. But um, thinking about lives and the life lived dedicated to getting stuff out there in whatever form <coughs> you can <laughs> and doing it in a way that is very deliberate and very careful and very loaded up with import 
is something that I've been considering in looking, I did talk about the Mike Kelly show and sort of looking at that body of work and looking at the polka show and the life dedicated to um, being a trickster and spitting out form. Um, this connects to this notion that I've borrowed and it was in one of the paintings of from Boetti, which is the shaman showman, and this kind of simultaneity, duality, I guess, of the artist as being both a showman or a kind of phony manipulator and a shaman, like a healer and sincere sort of channeler of some other force. And I think that this kind of simultaneity of those roles is something that for me, just it it feels it just it's been a few years now. I've been thinking about it, and it's just it, it rings pretty true for me. And I'm really starting to kind of grasp this what is this fraudulence. Um, I, somehow, when I saw it, when I started looking at the ectoplasm pictures again, I was like, oh my god, this thing that is so fake belies, like it, it's in the service of the utmost sincerity. So you have to be fake. Has, I, there's one more person in this room, probably besides me, who saw a video about the alien interviews on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there's a moment in this amazing sort of, I won't even go into it, alien interviews, that the, <laughs> The person who's supposedly like watching the alien and transcribing what the alien says says, I wouldn't have believed it had there not been a four foot puppet sitting in front of me. So it's like, I needed that stupid, ridiculous blob of alien bogusness in order to take the true me the message of what I was hearing seriously. <laughs> anyway, okay, me and you got that one. <laughs> Does that make sense? The fake being in service of the real, not as a kind of um, sham, but as a kind of inescapable condition, perhaps. I think that's the end. <laughs> I think I'm done. <laughs>
the recipient, the viewer, the person who might receive art? I think that the reviewer, the person who receives art is always celebrated from, from, from the gate in the sense that, that, that what I, I guess I intend, I, I, I think that in, if you go back to the beginning, which is speech is a symptom of affection, in the case of Emily Dickinson, the speech is the art in that sense that that the that art is made for that receiver, and um, or the, that Emily Dickinson wrote specifically. So she she her craft was so um, refined based on the fact that she had such a very specific, like clear understanding of who would be reading her and right and so. What I'm trying to talk about, I guess, is um, in a sense, because this is artist on artists, and I don't expect that I could say anything um, entirely, like anything informative about Ryman, I think that I'm trying to talk about the artist and me as an example, as the reader, as the person perching on the body, perching on the work. And, um, and, and that, that sort of, and then in my work in the evolution of it, that that perching, that the, that the, re, that the receiver is, is, making, is, is making a mark, that there's a sort of mark making of the receiver that becomes a kind of rhythm or becomes a kind of um, beauty in and of itself, this kind of the, the, the evidence of a reader on the text. You know, that little perch, that little like bloop, bloop, bloop. It's like, so I feel like the last thing I would ever want to do is to destroy the reader. I mean, one of the reasons I'm staring at the screen is because I'm reading and I, I, um, and I'm definitely, uh, yes, I'm definitely not trying to. No, no, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the, I guess the color, I'm just, I think, I guess I'm thinking about the form and I'm thinking about this idea, this, this, um, this notion or this, um, I just want to show this kind of, um, this trace, I suppose. It's very literal, you know, it's very literal, this kind of, um, trace and, and, and that something in our cell, as a teacher, something that I try to tell the artists who come in and wanting desperate, you know, the young 19 year olds who just desperately want to like make a style and get known, that, that, that being an artist is about falling in love with other art, you know, and that act of kind of being seduced or, or, um, falling in love with or that intimate act of receiving. And that's, I believe, what I'm trying to actually depict in the drawing. And then this is actually someone kind of making a, like almost like a diagrammatic case for um, aesthetic, you know, the text itself. The really about the talk tonight, not the work. And, and uh, is this how you talk about Volker and uh, Mike Kelly and when you do other talks about other artists too? Is it like this? Um, when I talk about polka, I talk specifically about connect, you know, specific works. And when I talk about Mike Kelly, I was talking specifically about his pedagogical legacy in the city of Los Angeles in relation to my practice. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I think with, um, yeah, I mean, is there something else that you want to ask or? Well, I don't think you answered the question. I mean, uh, I'm not. Yeah, I think I have to hear the question again. Fragmented and uh, scattered. A lot of it was. Most of it dealt with your not really being here, looking at us, but trying to sort of redefine or find a new way. not to receive or rhyme or somebody else or the, even the, the authors. It's, it's pretty hard to uh, deal with literary known 
of literary work then. Because the text that we look at, it's real. It's yeah. as real as holding a book in your hand. It's as real as somebody saying a poem out loud. But throwing up a, an image on the screen of a painting is far, far different. It's just a different size. It's just a reproduction. It's, uh, it's in that square. It's in this room. So there's a great difference between uh, with the way we can look at words, text, and the way we can look at painting. Well, yeah, so it seemed to me that this huge, uh, uh, what can we say, difference led you to perform in a way that was sort of demonstrating or actually um, doing a kind of reaction to that Impossible. Yeah, because you can't, because you can't, because what I was saying is like, I can't talk about what it feels like when I know the rhyme and switch is on when I'm, you know, like, or I could, and I, no, no, I know, but I, that's not what I'm going to do because we're, you know, because, but what happens here is this sort of obvious conflation and confusion between what is the body and what is the, you know, reset, re, what is the received part of it, you know, because here what happens is the receiver, and this is what, you know, the receiver recreates, a, you know, a kind of Greek text here. Do you know what the, re like Greek text, you know, it's like a, fa it looks like, oh, that's just filler. Like it's supposed to, you know, when you have like, if lorem ipsum, before someone turns in the text, you have fake text. So it's like the, re the act of reading itself creates a ghost text. <laughs> we did it. I love the way that you're actually talking to me now. Yeah, I, um, I think that this is, that was the connection with the polka and with the ectoplasm, is this notion of, of, of matter, you know, and I feel like when you, you know, like, I, yeah, it's like the matter reveals something else that is there that you can't see or something, which is sound, and then, then again we get into the sort of scary mysticism, but at the same time that kind of factuality of, of paper, for example. For me, you know, and you talked about how it's like these kind of extreme opposites, and for me it's always about that and coming back to the middle, because with paper and always these works in paper, paper is one of those things that's so, it's like so durable and it's so fragile. So it's like we every every mark is still in there, but it's totally fine, you know. So like the fact that paper, the sort of the evidence of papers. Um, so your way of presenting it is multi-directional. Yeah. You know, every sentence goes off in this direction, in that direction. So that was yeah. Something. Yeah, and I mean, I think as an artist, I try to write in space. I mean, here I'm talking about basic you know, more general ideas about apprehending knowledge or whatever. But in terms of, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we've already, we've already hit the thing. Yeah, so it's like, it's like the horizontal Oh, well, this is, well, this is one of, it also comes from one of my Instagrams. <laughs> and but it's and it's a square, but it's it's called it's um. There's a little bird here. <laughs> it's called, it has a title too. Wait, I'll read that. Then we might have to go. Watch out for flying bricks, baby. My self-liberated bird. <laughs> Does anybody else have any response or uh, further questions on that? Yeah, come on. Yes, you may. If I understood your intriguing uh, question, the uh, it was a problem of address that you felt was not being done properly. Um, but in keeping with uh, Dickinson and the Poe-esque idea of perching that you uh, introduced, the black on white of the raven, 
who's perched on a statue of Athena in the study where the poem is set, the dress is always, the address, sorry, the address is always for those two writers, love and death. Not either or, but love and death. You favored the affection, I think in the modern sense, which is uh, fondness, a sign of positive affect. But I think when all of this starts 175 years ago, affection is quite morbid. And uh, it's this interesting play of the blacked out Greek text, weakly rendered in gray now on our modern computers, like many things. But um, Ryman is quite cagey about that. Uh, I think as a human being and as a, as a painter of white, Yves-Alain Bois tells this wonderful story about doing a presentation down in Texas about Ryman's work, I think at an art school, and uh, someone said, a professor, what's the big deal about Ryman? He's just slapping white paint on a canvas. And Yves-Alain's response was, well, try and do one yourself. And a few weeks later, he did get a response, honestly enough, saying, I see what you mean. <laughs> I, I, all this to say, for those of us who may not have seen what you mean, I think there's a really vast, vast terrain between this black and white that... But there's a Lydia Davis great bit about had <laughs> sort of seeing what you mean. I, I can't just quote Lydia Davis off the top of my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get up. Um. I know I missed saying something really important. <laughs> but I think, you know, I mean, all this is sort of in the context of knowing that Ryman is someone who was so I don't know if that is the word I would use, cagey or what, like so careful about meaning. You know, like I didn't want, I used my name, careful about like, you know, I didn't, I, what am I saying? You know, so it's like I wanted to use a line, instead of using a line, I used my name because a signature is part of a painting. A line doesn't necessarily have to be part of a painting. So there's a great quote when he's talking about, I think I have it actually, you're looking at me like you're crazy. Um, but it was talking about um, the use of the signature and incorporating the signature in ter into the into the composition, um, um, in the context of everything that's visible counts and everything about a work has been made to count visually. But it was something um, about a kind of like oh my god a backing off of meaning. Like I, it's like I'm trying to I, if I had done a line it would be like I was trying to say something. But instead I put my name I wasn't saying anything. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a kind of. Um, <laughs> um, I got it from, I believe, the the Whitney catalog. I have it written here, right here. Yes, it's a really. Fun, it was a. It could be a complete uh, misinterpretation, but in any case, it's like this. This kind of carefulness about. Um, or, or that sort of this, this sort of double, the double. I just love that it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I know I have it word for word here about the line. But in any case, you got what I meant. This like the line would have been meaningful, but the na the signature, in that case, because it's a part of a painting, a component of, of all paintings, or then it isn't meaningful or intentional in that regard. Um, um, the f oh, oh, here's another here's another thing about the sort of content issue. I guess this is really I'm trying to say something about content here, and and, and referring to this the, a discussion about the red studio, the Matisse painting. Ryman says the fact that it was his studio is not important at all. The fact that it it, it was his studio is not important at all. It's how the painting 
holds together or what the painting is, but it's like it's really hard to believe or or make sense of the studio not being poor. You know, when you the fact that this to, to dismiss the studio's importance outright so so kind of cleanly to me feels that it's there's no way that it can be dismissed or something. Um, that's as a as a as a kind of <laughs> I'm gonna drop I'm gonna drop that one because I I don't think I could walk myself out of it. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Oh. You said there was a joke about the role of the artist. Oh, no, it was just more, it, it wasn't the, I guess when you see, when you see that on a wall, it, it's not really a joke. I mean, it's just, it's, it's more about what, that, ah, <laughs> there, it's, it's just a play, I guess, of like where the image sits on the wall, and because it's an index of the wall of the studio wall being kind of used for like a impure purpose or something, I suppose. Oh, I was saying something about how I was angry in terms of when I was thinking, talking about the lot, what it means to for a studio art in my particular situation right now as a professor at a university, um, the status of studio art is very tenuous. And the status of the studio artist as a philosophical being or whatever is not even, you know, is really like not taken seriously. So I feel like, you know, what I was, I was, you know, referencing something that some people may have heard about or read about me talking about, uh, is is my sort of frustration and anger at at how the field of art is being shaped by the world of tech in my particular um, context at USC. Well, yeah, and it's also like breaking the, you know, breaking down the barrier or something. But it's such a, it's such a like violent gesture. Um, but yeah, so I, it's not a very funny joke, I guess. <laughs> Okay, I think that's a nice place to end. Thank you so much, Francis. <laughs>